uh, the, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Tobman, uh, professor in the Department of Cell Biology, to introduce uh, Dr. Paris. Go ahead, Tom. Thanks, Rick. Um, so it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Malik Paris. Um, Dr. Paris first obtained a Bachelor of Medicine and a Bachelor of Surgery degree from the University of Ceylon in Sri Lanka. And subsequently, he moved to the UK and then competed a, uh, competed a doc, um, Doctor of uh, Science degree at Oxford. Uh, after completing his DSC, Dr. Paris has held a number of academic positions at prestigious universities in the UK and Sri Lanka before moving to Hong Kong in 1995. So currently, he is a professor and the chair of virology in the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. In addition, Dr. Paris is an honorary consultant microbiologist at Queen Mary Hospital, uh, co-director of the WHO H5 Reference Laboratory and SARS Reference Laboratories, and co-director of WHO Reference Laboratories providing confirmatory testing for COVID-19 at the University of Hong Kong. Um, so Dr. Paris has had an outstanding academic career in, in service in public health, and he's supervised more than 50 graduate and postgraduate level trainees, and he's published over 800 peer-reviewed articles, many in outstanding journals, including Nature, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, PNAS, Nature Medicine, and, and others. He is a fellow of at least six professional bodies, including the Royal College of Pathologists in the UK, uh, the Royal College of Physicians and the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine, and he holds multiple honorary doctorates and too many other awards to, to mention in this venue. In 2021, Dr. Paris was awarded the John Dirks Canada Gar Gardner uh, Global Health Award for his work which led to understanding the origins and options for control of newly infectious disease outbreaks in Asia, notably zoonotic influenza and severe acute Respiratory Syndrome, also known as SARS. So together with Dr. Guan Yi, also at the University of Hong Kong, he initiated seminal studies on the understand, underlying causes of H5 virus path pathogenicity, the evolution of the H5N1 virus. They also developed a highly effective monitoring and surveillance program uh, for avian and swine influenza virus strains. Doctors Guan and, and Paris established that live poultry markets in southern China and Hong Kong were the source of the virus spreading to humans, which in some cases exhib exhibited up to 60% lethality. Their subsequent work established new protocols for periodic live poultry market closures, emptying these markets of poultry overnight to reduce virus amplification in these markets and the appropriate use of poultry vaccines to protect both poultry and people in Hong Kong from H5N1 infections. They also made major contributions towards understanding the emergence, transmission, epidemiology, and pathogenesis of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenzas, including H5N1, H9N2, H6N1, H7N9, and others, and have provided evidence-based options for control of uh, avian influenza viruses in Asia. In 2003, Dr. Perez led the team that first identified the responsible for the SARS epidemic, uh, which is known as the SARS-CoV-1 uh, coronavirus, uh, also elucidating its pathogenesis transmission and quickly developed a diagnostic te test for the virus, which was then shared internationally. The isolation and characterization of the causative agent of SARS uh, and quick development of a diagnostic test directly influenced public health policy to effectively monitor and control the spread of the disease. Dr. Paris and Guan's comprehensive strategies for surveillance, diagnosis, and control of emerging infectious disease outbreaks was again proven important for mitigating the morbidity and mortality caused by the 2009 swine flu uh, pandemic, the outbreak of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, and now the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Paris's talk this morning is entitled From Pasteur to SARS and Beyond, A Personal Journey. Welcome, Dr. Paris. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Hoffman, for that kind introduction. 
And uh, I'd like to thank the University of Alberta for organizing this uh, meeting, The Minds That Matter. And of course, uh, my thanks to the John Dirks Canada Gaidna Foundation for awarding Guani and myself the 2021 Global Health Award. Uh, which, of course, uh, is not just for the two of us, but uh, really is a recognition of our whole uh, team. Uh, if I can try to share my screen. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I have uh, entitled my presentation From Pasteur to SARS and Beyond, uh, A Personal Journey. Uh, so when I was, uh, so what I will try to do is uh, give you a couple of overlapping stories uh, and, and are not necessarily sequential in time. Uh, I'll have to come back in time uh, because they are uh, overlapping in time. Uh, when I was uh, 14 years of age um, in Sri Lanka, uh, I read a book uh, on the life of Louis Pasteur and uh, I was really fascinated by this scientist, he not only made very important discoveries in organic chemistry, but he established the germ theory of disease, the scientific basis of vaccination, uh, translating this basic science to application, and quite importantly, disseminating this knowledge worldwide through the establishment of uh, Pasteur Network Laboratories. And uh, as uh, uh, I was to learn later, it's, it was one of his students, uh, Alexandra Yesin, who uh, uh, came to Hong Kong in 1894 uh, and uh, discovered the cause of the plague. And what you see there is his temporary laboratory, which in fact, uh, although it's not there now, it was not far from where my laboratory today is situated. And uh, as uh, life would have it, uh, in 2009, I had the honor to become one of the directors of the international, one of the international Pasteur uh, laboratory networks, uh, lab laboratories in Hong Kong. So let me go back to the early uh, beginnings in Sri Lanka. Uh, as was mentioned, I, I did my undergraduate training in medicine, but uh, right through, I wanted to become a researcher. And uh, in this, I was really inspired by the then professor of microbiology, uh, Chabi Arasagul Ratna, at uh, my alma mater at the University of Peradeniya, because he really showed that even in resource limited settings, that you could do good science. Whereas most other uh, academics, uh, unfortunately, in Sri Lanka were very dismissive of the capacity or the ability to, to carry out science in a place uh, like Sri Lanka. As was mentioned, I did my um, uh, doctoral training at the University of Oxford. I returned then to the University of Peradeniya uh, to try to set up cell culture and virology laboratory there. Now, this was quite uh, challenging because even simple things like the ultra pure water that you need for cell culture uh, was um, not not available. I had to traipse across uh, city to a, a veterinary lab, which was a, a, a vaccine laboratory, uh, and uh, um, regularly bring in the ultra pure water from there. Uh, as many of you will know, one of the basic items of equipment for cell culture is a carbon dioxide incubator to maintain a, a five percent atmosphere of carbon dioxide. But this at the the initial stages was not available. Um, but luckily I had seen in one of the labs that I worked, somebody using this trick of using uh, transparent plastic boxes and you put in, in a small container, a bit of sodium bicarbonate, uh, add in some dilute, acid, a dilute acetic acid and immediately seal the box. Uh, and you can, by getting the proportions right, you can generate an atmosphere of carbon dioxide in order to do those experiments. So that is how I really got this lab up and running. In due course, of course, I was able to get uh, some of these equipment through grants from the Wellcome Trust and NIH. We made some um, uh, worthwhile research contributions, including making the first uh, monoclonal antibodies to Plasmodium vivax in collaboration with uh, a parasitologist colleague, 
and uh, using those to identify uh, the, the targets of uh, blocking transmission uh, of the uh, Plasmodium vivax parasite and uh, studies on uh, mosquito-borne viruses. But what I want to talk about uh, in particular is this experience um, uh, amongst some of this, uh, this uh, six-year period that I was in Sri Lanka. The, uh, the, the Mahavali River, the longest uh, river in the country, uh, was being dammed for hydropower and for irrigation. And uh, uh, so this was leading to a huge uh, uh, ecological change in, in, in a fairly large part of the country. Together with an entomologist colleague and myself, we were wondering whether this uh, ecological change might have an uh, impact on emerging uh, mosquito-borne or tick-borne virus infection. So we set up uh, a study site at the stage of the forested stage of development and basically stayed there right through the phases of development of clearing of the forest, uh, irrigation, um, uh, introduction of agriculture and human settlement. And we were expecting, of course, uh, uh, some emerging outbreak to occur there. But as usual, uh, what happened was uh, there was an outbreak of a mosquito borne disease, but that occurred uh, in a different part of the country, which was very stable, had not undergone this type of ecological change. But nevertheless, since we had all the tools available, we went to investigate that outbreak and we identified the mosquitoes that carry the virus. Uh, we uh, characterized the human outbreak, um, uh, characterized the virus itself. So the question was, why this particular outbreak now? Uh, just to give you the perspective, Japanese encephalitis had been reported in Sri Lanka, but the whole country had maybe 10 to 12 cases a year. And now we had 500 cases in a single hospital in three months. So what exactly had changed? Um, so like I said, we looked at the mosquitoes, we looked at the virus, we looked at the environment. And in fact, what proved to be the driver of this outbreak was a very well-meaning intervention by the local provincial government uh, to introduce pig breeding as a, a way to supplement the economy uh, of the poor peasant farmer. So every farmer was given free of charge uh, 10 or 12 pigs to have uh, in, in his backyard for protein as well as for sale. So the pig is an amplifier host for Japanese encephalitis. So in a situation where the virus was present in wild birds, the uh, environment was ideal for the mosquito vector, which was present in abundance, uh, this very well-meaning introduction was what led the spark uh, to this huge outbreak. Now, we then went on to um, investigate uh, what other parts of the country might be at risk of Japanese encephalitis uh, and what parts of the country might be safe for a pig husbandry. And uh, we were, uh, and this led us to conclude that there were two areas that, that were at high risk. And one, in fact, was exactly that area that we were studying undergoing rapid uh, environmental change. Uh, and in fact, as part of that development program, there were uh, in addition to providing irrigation, there was also an animal husbandry component and pigs were part of that uh, uh, component as well. But with the evidence uh, from this out the previous outbreak, we were able to explain to them that that would be a bad idea. And, and luckily we were able to stop at least uh, introduction of pigs, although other livestock uh, would be safe. But equally, uh, we found other areas of the country, particularly at high ele elevations in the hill country, which were, from a vector-borne point of view, uh, quite safe for uh, animal husbandry. So this uh, really uh, taught me an important lesson. Uh, and of course, today, this is what is called One Health. In other words, optimal health of people, animals, and the environment. And the fact that we really have to look at these problems from um, not just from a human health angle, but uh, together with animal health uh, and environmental sciences as well. Now, fast forward uh, almost a decade, I then uh, took up an appointment at uh, 
the University of Hong Kong. And one of my tasks was to set up uh, a diagnostic virology lab for the Queen Mary Hospital uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, within two years of taking on that uh, job, we were then faced with the avian flu H5N1 outbreak in Hong Kong. This was a highly uh, pathogenic um, uh, virus of poultry that uh, started to spill over to humans. We had 18 cases and six deaths. And uh, the, the source of human infection was identified to be these live poultry markets and a, a, a Hong Kong wide depopulation of poultry uh, successfully brought that outbreak under control. Uh, after that uh, initial outbreak was brought under control, uh, I was interested to look at um, whether the virus is persisting in the wider environment. And that is where I joined my co-awardee, Yi Guan, uh, very much under the mentorship of uh, Robert Webster at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. He, uh, as some of you might know, is uh, probably regarded as the father of modern influenza virology, and, and he was uh, immensely instrumental in both of our careers, uh, Guanis and myself. Uh, to, to cut a long story short, we could see evidence of the precursor virus, that, that H5 virus uh, in, in, in geese, and then we could see it evolving, influenza viruses of eight gene segments. So you can see them swapping gene segments, uh, adapting from uh, geese to, to ducks and then back to chicken. And we were clearly very much on alert uh, to problems that might arise. Uh, and uh, as part of this uh, response, uh, we had set up an avian influenza task force, which included the, the participants from the Department of Health, Department of Agriculture, the Department of Food and Environmental Hygiene, and the universities. So again, this was One Health in Action before the concept of One Health became uh, as popular as it is right now. Uh, through these studies, we were able to show that what was going on is that poultry were coming in from many different farms. And of course, uh, at that time, 90% of poultry sold in, live poultry sold in Hong Kong was imported from mainland China. They came into one large wholesale poultry market. And from there, uh, it was distributed to a number of small retail poultry markets, such as what you see here. And uh, what we were able to show is that these small retail poultry markets were an ideal venue for the virus to persist and thrive. So for example, uh, what one of the proofs of this was that when we, well, first and foremost, you could clean these poultry markets as much as you like, but you will not get rid of the virus because after all the virus is in the poultry themselves. So the only way to interrupt transmission was to empty the, the market completely of poultry. And here you see one of those um, uh, studies that was done, eight poultry markets before closing the market for one day, uh, six of these markets had evidence of, uh, this is not H5N1, but another avian influenza virus, which is less pathogenic, but we use it as an indicator of avian influenza virus activity. You can see that there was uh, evidence of virus activity. Day or two after closure and reopening, it had dropped almost to zero. But by the next month, it is up again, close the market for a day, it is down again, up again, down again. So proving this concept that the virus enters infrequently, but once it enters, it, it remains there. And then we also were able to show that outbreaks in poultry farms were also uh, related to these live poultry markets by people moving cages and uh, the people themselves carrying the virus back into these poultry farms. So with this knowledge, we were able to introduce a whole series of interventions, including rest days where one day of the month or two days for the month, the poultry market was closed. And then later on, when uh, the market was empty of poultry overnight, so in the morning, poultry come in, they are sold, but they're emptied overnight. And you can see the very dramatic reduction of virus activity in these markets with these fairly simple management interventions. Uh, 
with this surveillance and the awareness uh, and the actions that were taken, and I'm giving you only just a few of the interventions that were taken, there have been no further cases of uh, severe avian influenza in humans in Hong Kong since 1997. However, in 2004, um, country after country, region after region, awoke to the fact that they had this highly pathogenic H5N1 virus within their borders and spilling over to cause human disease. And I think the lesson there is that uh, proactive surveillance, proactive interventions based on surveillance and evidence-based interventions can protect uh, from subsequent much uh, worse outcomes uh, uh, compared to um, uh, if you don't take these measures. Uh, later on, we were all also, um, my colleague uh, Yen Huiling, working in collaboration with the colleagues in, in southern China, uh, because there was some evidence that some of the patients who developed avian flu disease did not actually touch poultry or even go into the live poultry market. So we wondered whether the virus was present in the air. So we did air sampling in these markets so we could detect uh, live virus in air samples and identify this bit of uh, machinery called a defeathering machine. This is after the poultry are killed, they are put into this uh, with some water and spun around to remove the feathers. And uh, as you can imagine, this generates a lot of aerosol and this was the, uh, the, the area of highest risk for detecting virus in the air. And in collaboration with uh, colleagues in our Department of Engineering, we've been able to do some simple modifications to this apparatus to reduce the risk of aerosol spreading. So this is um, uh, airborne uh, droplets coming out in the original version, and this is the modified version. So these are some of the measures that uh, we have been taking to reduce the risk of um, avian influenza. Now, uh, another understanding that uh, Guani uh, and I got to through these studies of virus evolution uh, with, for example, the studying first the emergence of the more recent H7N9 virus, but it was also true of H5N1 and H10N8 and other concerning avian influenza viruses, was that um, six of the gene segments, if you remember, I told you that influenza viruses have eight gene segments. Six of these gene segments come from a very common poultry virus, a chicken virus called H9N2. Uh, this picks up uh, the H and N gene segments from wild bird viruses, and that comes from wild birds to chickens through domestic ducks. So uh, this is the pathway, and the fact of the matter is that the marketing system at the moment uh, mixes aquatic poultry like ducks and geese together with chickens, and that is what allows these novel viruses to emerge. So separation of the marketing chain between um, aquatic and terrestrial birds would also be a generic measure that in theory could reduce the emergence of future uh, zoonotic influenza viruses. Now, one of the other things that I was interested in about avian influenza was the severity of the disease. Um, the avian influenza H5N1 was associated with a mortality of over 50%. And we had shown that um, in, in vitro, the host response, particularly the innate immune response with H5N1 influenza was very different to what we saw with seasonal influenza. So we believe that uh, the pathogenesis was partially linked to, to this dysregulation of uh, innate immunity. We have subsequently, uh, uh, this is work done by one of my colleagues, Michael Chan and myself, we have set up an experimental model to uh, mimic what goes on in the air spaces, the alveolar spaces of the lung. And uh, what we have demonstrated is that when a virus like H5N1 infects these alveolar epithelial cells, they release soluble mediators that then feed back to downregulate these uh, sodium and chloride transporter channels that are found on the alveolar epithelial cells. Now these uh, channels are essentially pumps 
that remove fluid accumulating into the alveolus. Uh, they pump it out so that uh, the, the alveolus is kept free of fluid and able to do its job of air exchange. If you block these pumps, essentially, you accumulate fluid in the alveolar spaces, and that is what leads to the acute lung injury and the severe pneumonia that you see in these virus infections. We then went on to show that this damage can be reversed with certain interventions, such as mesenchymal stromal cell therapy. These are the treated mice. You can see the lungs are looking much better than the untreated mice here. And now we are using these models to explore uh, options for other small molecule therapies that can reverse uh, this uh, fluid accumulation. Let me now move back in time to 2003. Uh, that was the time that we heard about this unusual pneumonia uh, that was to be called SARS, uh, taking place in, in Guangdong uh, in Southern China. In Hong Kong, we are, we are at, the, at the border of uh, Guangdong. Uh, so it was obvious that the uh, virus would spill over to Hong Kong. We set up surveillance uh, together with the hospital authority. We were able to isolate uh, uh, a suspected virus, which we showed to be associated with this disease. We obtained partial sequence information, which showed that it was a novel coronavirus, um, uh, uh, not identical to any of the known animal or human coronaviruses uh, known to humans before. And then with this power sequence information, we were also able to set up diagnostic tests. So within a week of uh, isolating the virus and sequencing it, we, we had uh, developed diagnostic tests, which we rolled out progressively uh, in our hospital system. Now, this, of course, is not what we would do normally. Uh, we would have a much longer period of assessment and evaluation of a diagnostic test. But this was an emergency, and essentially, we had to build the ship as it sailed. And uh, luckily, that job was done effectively, and, and the, the, the tests worked perfectly well. Uh, using these diagnostic tests, we were able to characterize a number of features of the disease. So we found that the virus was not only present in the respiratory tract, it was also present in the stool. Uh, and indeed, some of the patients did have quite a significant diarrhea as part of the presentation. And at least in one example in Hong Kong, uh, there was a large outbreak that was associated with the fecal aerosolization and contamination. There was another very unusual feature to this disease in that if you look at the quantity of virus in the upper respiratory tract of these patients, in the early phase of infection, the amount of virus in the upper respiratory tract was very low. It was at the end of the first week that uh, the viral load increased uh, dramatically. As you can see here, this is a logarithmic scale. So what this meant was that it's likely that early in the infection, patients were not so infectious. And indeed, that turned out to be the case. The epidemiological data also suggested that transmission was much less likely in the first four or five days of illness. Now, there was another uh, interesting and fortuitous um, uh, finding in the case of SARS. Uh, what you see here is a very majority of common respiratory viruses like influenza. Uh, you see that most of the infections are very mild and only a small proportion of them are severe. In the case of SARS, the vast majority of these infections were very severe. And this, of course, helped to identify the cases and diagnose them and get them out um, uh, into hospitals so that the chain of transmission in the community could be broken. And that is how uh, the outbreak of SARS was contained globally. And so that by, it was March when we first, um, um, the, 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 the infection or February when it spilled over in Hong Kong, March when we identified the virus. But by July, it was possible for WHO to state that all known chains of person-to-person -person transmission of SARS may now have been broken. Now, uh, other, influence, other viruses such as influenza have a very different profile uh, of viral load so that patients are infectious right from the time of onset of symptoms or even before. And in fact, when COVID-19 emerged, we collaborated with colleagues in Guangdong 
very early on. And by November, by February of last year, we had reported that the profile uh, of viral load of COVID-19 um, resembles influenza rather than SARS. So that the measures that uh, were able to contain SARS were very unlikely to be able to contain COVID-19. And sadly, that uh, proved to be the case. Now, uh, part of this uh, SARS response uh, was uh, a, a, a really unique and great experience coordinated by WHO when about 12 of the laboratories worldwide who were dealing with this problem were linked up every night, uh, every day, uh, it was nighttime for us, with teleconferences. <coughs> and we were sharing the information that we were gathering in real time. And uh, indeed, uh, some of the people I got to know during this uh, experience were, uh, was the late Donald Lowe, uh, who was the, the head of microbiology at uh, Mount Sinai uh, Hospital in Toronto, and Theresa Tan, who I believe is now the chief medical officer uh, in Canada. The next question, of course, uh, was where did SARS come from? It was clear it was a completely new virus. It was very likely to come from animals to humans. Uh, and uh, my colleague Guani then followed up a number of epidemiological clues to go and test uh, these large game animal markets that you find in southern China. And he found evidence of SARS-like viruses there. And it was that information that subsequently led the Guangdong authorities to close these game animal markets. Uh, because the virus was persisting there even after the human outbreak had been brought to a halt. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure that that intervention prevented the re-emergence of this virus uh, from, uh, from this uh, source. Uh, subsequently, it was shown that the natural reservoir to, you know, of the virus are, are these small Chinese horseshoe bats. And uh, the exact identification of the closest precursor to the SARS 2003 virus took almost 10 years, as you can see here. Uh, now, you might ask why SARS did not emerge before. Uh, and uh, the fact of the matter is that this culture of eating wild game animal meat has been a traditional uh, cultural habit going back centuries. But the large, um, uh, the, the the large game animal markets where hundreds and thousands of animals were brought together was a recent phenomenon uh, as part of the affluence uh, taking place in southern China and the demand, uh, demand creating a supply. And then, of course, uh, air travel, which uh, has uh, increased so much, that means that any outbreak anywhere in the world can be everywhere within a matter of days. So many of the changes we ourselves uh, as humans introduce are facilitating the emergence and spread of some of these um, uh, viral, viral diseases. In the case of uh, COVID-19, I will just highlight two of the contributions we made. Uh, very early on, we developed the diagnostic tests uh, for COVID-19 and uh, um, it was one of the first uh, diagnostic tests to be on the WHO website. And uh, we have distributed, on request, distributed reagents for these tests to over 170 laboratories in 77 countries. And a number of countries uh, made their first um, detection of COVID-19 using these tests. This was, of course, before commercial tests became available. Another uh, important finding that was uh, this was work that we were doing before SARS because we were very interested in transmission of respiratory viruses, particularly influenza. But some of the patients we were studying were other coronaviruses, not SARS, not COVID-19, that not SARS coronavirus too, but uh, other coronaviruses. And what we could see in these other coronavirus infections was that uh, infected patients were shedding these viruses in the air through, these are air sampling studies, and both large droplets and small droplets, uh, aerosols, were carrying these infectious viruses. And even more importantly, when the same patient wore a surgical mask, we could see that the release of these airborne particles was largely blocked. 
So this was one of the factors, or particularly once it became clear that patients with COVID-19 were being infectious even before they developed symptoms, uh, this data became important as one of the uh, evidence uh, to, uh, to uh, argue for universal masking uh, of the general population, uh, even if they were apparently healthy. Now, uh, before I close, I just want to turn to another coronavirus disease, and that is MERS coronavirus. You may have heard uh, this is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, there have been repeated outbreaks um, over the, the last uh, number of years since it was first reported in 2012, some outbreaks uh, of over 100 or 200 cases and one outbreak from one infected person in, in South Korea leading to 186 cases. Now, one of the things that fascinated uh, our group was the fact that well, dromedary camels are known to be the source of human infection, but most of the dromedary camels in the global uh, uh, worldwide are found in Africa, not in Saudi Arabia. Whereas all the human cases that originate from camels to humans occur in the Arabian Peninsula, although travel associated cases may be found elsewhere. So why was no MERS cases being reported from Africa. Um, so to cut a long story short, we, we have done studies in multiple countries in Africa. We showed that the amount of virus in camels is no different to that in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but when you look at antibodies in camel workers, we don't have evidence of infection. Uh, we don't see evidence of antibodies as evidence of infection. However, when we look at T cells, uh, which is another the other immunologic the other arm of the immune response, here you uh, you can see the data showing that uh, CD4, CD8 T cells. These are positive control patients from Saudi Arabia. These are negative control patients. They are very clear. And now we have uh, camel workers in an abattoir in Nigeria. Uh, workers in that abattoir not directly working with camels and controls from the city, uh, adjacent city. And you can see that the camel workers, about 30% of them actually have very specific signals from MERS coronavirus T cell responses. So, uh, and we, are, we have in the paper uh, shown why we are confident that these responses are specific. Uh, phylogenetically, we can see that the viruses in Africa are distinct from the viruses in Saudi Arabia or the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and we can show that the, the viruses in Africa have lower replication competence in the human bronchus and in the human lung compared to those viruses in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and uh, using pseudoviruses, uh, uh, pseudotyped with the spike of say the Saudi virus compared to the African virus, we can see virus entry is reduced. So uh, it appears that first and foremost, that human infection is taking place in Africa, but is largely unrecognized and uh, ignored. And we really need enhanced surveillance uh, of MERS coronavirus at the animal in human interface uh, in Africa, in, in the camel herding regions in Africa. So. If I can summarize, um, I've tried to show the importance of the One Health approach. Uh, the fact that we need to look at these emerging infectious disease problems uh, from the human, animal, and environmental health point of view. The importance of surveillance and risk assessment. I hope I showed that with the examples we used for avian flu, for SARS, uh, and for MERS. Uh, unfortunately, now there is a tendency to, to regard this type of work, um, surveillance at the animal-human interface and risk assessment of these viruses as dangerous science. Uh, I, subject, I, I submit that this is not dangerous science. It is essential for pandemic preparedness and for identifying measures for risk reduction. Uh, I fear future pandemics are inevitable. COVID-19 is not the most severe pandemic conceivable, and I think we really need to learn the lessons from COVID-19 to be better prepared for the future. And uh, 
I think I would like to end by going beyond pandemics. Uh, I think COVID-19 has highlighted the limits of human hubris. And I'm uh, struck by the quotation by Rene Dubois, a French uh, microbiologist and philosopher back in the 1950s, when at a time when a lot of people thought that uh, antibiotics and vaccines were essentially controlling infectious diseases, he said that at some unpredictable time and in some unforeseeable manner, nature will strike back. And what we see with COVID-19 is nature striking back. And indeed, it is not just with pandemics. I think uh, we are, uh, uh, nature is striking back in regard to climate change, environmental degradation, environmental pollution, and uh, as a human species, we are running the risk of rupturing the limits of planetary sustainability. Uh, and I think uh, I will end with this thought that uh, while, of course, we are concerned about pandemics and COVID-19 now, and hopefully how we can deal with pandemics, uh, be deal better with pandemics in the future, this is a problem beyond pandemics. Uh, and I think we really have to take cognizance uh, of uh, um, um, arranging our societies in a more sustainable manner. So with that, I will end um, just with my acknowledgements. This is a, a, a photograph taken soon after SARS, and it uh, has a num number of the key people who contributed to this. This, of course, is Guani, the co-awardee, but uh, uh, Leo Poon, uh, K.H. Chan, John Nichols, who did electron microscopy, Leo Poon, who, who got the initial partial sequence, uh, K.Y. Yuen, who did a lot of the clinical work. And of course, um, I, I again want to emphasize the uh, mentorship of Robert Webster throughout uh, um, my latter part of my career. Gabriel Long, uh, our dean and previously head of the School of Public Health, and of course, many others that I've had the good fortune to collaborate with. Um, and, and with that, I will end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paris, for that uh, very exciting uh, presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions on the chat. I'll start with those. Um, the first one was, if the profile of viral load is identical with for COVID to influenza, despite having um, greater genetic closeness to SARS, I was wondering if there is a much higher selective pressure for COVID variants in terms of pathogenesis, what is your opinion? Well, the 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 the, the, sim the similarity in the viral load profile uh, imp has implications for transmission, uh, because what it means is that uh, patients are transmitting uh, e even before they develop symptoms, because uh, you, you certainly have high viral loads even before they have uh, symptoms, and uh, in the first few days after onset of symptoms. So that is the the primary problem uh, that, that we face. And, and um, unlike SARS, where we have this window where if you could catch them uh, and get them into isolation, we could break the chain of transmission. Now, there is a, there is a bit of a mystery there because after all, uh, as far as is known at the moment, the receptor for SARS-1 and SARS-2 is the same. It's the same ACE2 receptor. So uh, one might ask why there is such a big difference in the in this profile uh, of uh, viral load kinetics uh, in the two diseases, and I don't think we have the full answer to that. Uh, Co-receptors may be an important part of that, uh, but certainly the the consequences for public health are quite uh, uh, dramatic. Another question here, do you have any comments about the value and or risk of gain of function studies? So I think uh, this of course is a, is, a, is a hot topic at the moment. Now, there's no question that uh, gain of function studies uh, have to be uh, uh, regulated and uh, uh, considered very carefully 
before they are done. And of course, you have to also consider what exactly is meant by gain of function. There are, there are a lot of studies uh, in virology that involve uh, manipulating genes of the virus itself, uh, or maybe swapping genes from one variant of the virus to another variant of the virus. Uh, these uh, types of studies would not be gain of function because we are dealing with things that are already present in the, uh, in the environment uh, and out in nature anyway. Now, uh, of course, there are other studies, uh, and this came particularly came to the fore with the H5N1 studies that were done back in 2012, when, there were, when the aim of the study was to try to see if the H5N1 virus could be transmitted um, by the airborne route in an experimental model system. And that rightly led to uh, a pause, uh, a lot of concern, and a pause uh, of those studies until a structure was put into place to assess uh, what was first and foremost assess whether a study was worthwhile to do, whether there was a rationale, whether there was uh, the, the benefit that could be obtained would outweigh the risks. And secondly, whether such a study could be safely done and under what conditions it could be done. Uh, and some uh, of these studies have um, uh, been allowed to, to proceed. Now, I think uh, this type of studies are important, but without a doubt, they do need to be considered very carefully and uh, regulated uh, very carefully as well. And the proper appropriate levels of containment should be used uh, for these studies. Another question, uh, you mentioned MSC therapy in animal studies. There have been hundreds of clinical trials now being done for MSCs for COVID-19. Please comment, is your um, uh, HKU, Hong Kong University, or your team involved in any of these trials? No, we ourselves are not uh, involved in any of these trials. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of the work that's going on with uh, COVID-19, but also uh, uh, before that, in, uh, uh, in other contexts of um, um, uh, acute respiratory dis distress syndrome. Uh, what we are, well, because it is uh, somewhat challenging uh, to, to do these uh, stem cell, mesenchymal stem cell therapy interventions, what we are focusing on is to, uh, to try to identify small molecules that would do the same job of reversing the, uh, the block of these uh, uh, transporter proteins that we, are, uh, that we observed in our experimental model. And the last question on the uh, Q&A uh, site is from uh, Dr. Lauren Terrell, who's a longtime supporter of this uh, event. Uh, do you see um, uh, as the future of COVID, what, what do you, sorry, excuse me, see as the future of COVID-19 and will it ever disappear or remain long-term, a threat long-term? Well, I mean, the virus itself would, uh, would certainly remain. I mean, I can't see the virus disappearing. Uh, so it will become another one of those uh, endemic respiratory viruses. I mean, keep in mind that over the last uh, maybe 500 years, we have had at least two other coronaviruses that have jumped from animals to humans. The two common cold coronaviruses, 2290 and OC43, we now realize uh, came from, um, uh, from cattle and maybe from camels, in fact, uh, or from bats to humans uh, over the last four or 500 years. Uh, and now, of course, they're they are widespread. Uh, so COVID-19 will become like that I think the challenge for us is to, uh, to be able to learn to live with this so that the more, uh, more severe parts of disease can be modulated through vaccination and then ultimately by immunity. Um, uh, and then hopefully with more therapeutic agents uh, coming online, uh, we uh, will be able to, to continue to coexist with this virus, but I don't see it disappearing. 
Okay, I don't see any more questions at this point. I will thank you again for those responses. And I, I'd like to end by um, thanking um, uh, both speakers, Dr. Nusa and Paris, for uh, their virtual, joining us virtually in Edmonton and, and for their outstanding presentations and, and their uh, response to, to our queries. Um, with that, I, I would conclude today's symposium and, and hopefully everyone enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for coming and have a great day. Thank you.